so um, my name is Jennifer Hoban. I'm really happy to be here. I don't know if you had a chance to read my bio, but I actually did my undergraduate at Stony Brook and graduated in 1999. So uh, it's actually really fun to be back here and see how much the campus has changed. Uh, I'm currently here representing the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology, where uh, I'm the Director of Science Policy. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, how I got into science policy, what it is that uh, we do in science policy, uh, the skills and abilities you need uh, to make a transition, uh, and how to uh, hopefully acquire those skills and abilities. Um, so please feel free to, to stop me uh, as I go. Just to put my remarks in context, let me tell you a little bit about FASA. But before I do that, by show of hands, how many are postdocs in here? I assume most of you. And we have some graduate students. Oh, actually more graduate students. OK, and any undergraduates? OK, so most, mostly graduate students. That's helpful. And how many people have heard of FASA? Oh, yay. That'll make my boss very happy. <laughs> Um, so for those of you who haven't, uh, we're the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology. We are an umbrella organization representing 26 disciplinary scientific societies. Uh, and our goal is to uh, help those organizations advance biological and biomedical research. So for those of you, um, let me just take another show of hands. How many in here are from a biology discipline? Physics? And Engineering, chemistry, okay. So that's about what I expected. Most of the postdocs are in uh, the biological sciences. Um, but uh, I hope that, you know, I'm a, uh, I work for a biology organization. I'm a uh, neuroscientist by training, but um, I hope what I have to say will resonate with those of you who are not in the biological sciences as well. And do please feel free to sort of stop and ask questions if you feel like what I'm talking about is not somehow relevant to you. Um, but for those of you in biology, if you haven't heard of FASA, you've probably heard of one of these organizations. These are our, our member societies. We represent um, uh, ASBMB, biochemists and molecular biologists, protein scientists, anatomists, physiologists, geneticists, uh, more clinically oriented uh, scientists, people who do pediatrics research, uh, and so on and so forth. And so all of these organizations are the scientific societies that publish journals that the biologists um, in this room might submit their papers to or subscribe to. They hold scientific meetings. They do uh, career and uh, professional uh, development offerings for their members. Um, what seems to be a little bit less known is what they do in uh, public policy and government affairs. But most of these organizations, and indeed most scientific societies, have some kind of public affairs presence. So they are uh, actively advocating for the interests of their members, their scientists, to the federal government and other policymakers. And at FASA, what we try to do is amplify the voice of all of these members by representing them on uh, kind of issues that are of cross-cutting interest. So um, what is science policy? So it seems when I, I tr transitioned into science policy about seven years ago, seven and a half years ago, and at the time I really didn't know much about it. And it seems like uh, graduate students and postdocs are much more savvy uh, these days. So, um, but I, I'll, since you're all here wanting to learn about science policy, I'll try to start from the beginning. And I apologize if I'm telling you things you already know. But I think of science pol policy as sort of falling into two broad categories. There's science for policy. So this is applying scientific uh, information to policy decision making. And then there's policy for science. So this is informing and developing the laws, regulations, guidance, and such that govern the scientific enterprise. On the uh, first part, um, I guarantee that everybody in this room, that every discipline represented in this room has, uh, has sort of some, uh, there, there are some issues that sort of policymakers are concerned about. They're making sort of decisions around your scientific discipline in one form or, or another. So if you're an environmental uh, scientist or climatologist, your, your expertise may be called upon to help the federal government or state governments for that matter make decisions on how to mitigate climate change, you know, reduce carbon emissions and so forth. Um, you probably all heard about the collapse of bee colonies in the United States and the loss of uh, uh, other pollinators. Uh, this has uh, relevance for agricultural policy. And if you work in this area, then your expertise might be relevant. 
Um, obesity is a huge issue in this country. Um, Michelle Obama has shined a big spotlight on it. If you're a health psychologist or an endocrinologist, then you know your expertise again might be helpful in developing sort of uh, intervention strategies at the sort of state and federal level for reducing obesity. Um, Physics uh, is not an area I know a tremendous uh, amount about, but you know uh, one thing um, is building deep underground science and engineering laboratories. You know the federal government wants to know, you know should we invest in this kind of infrastructure? They need to hear from physicists to you know let them know these are the kinds of experiments that we would perform. This is why it's necessary. This is the sort of infrastructure needed. Politicians uh, who don't have a scientific background cannot make these decisions without, we, and we hope that they won't make these decisions without being, <laughs> being informed at some level by the scientific community. Um, so on the other side is the policy for science issues. So you might not be thinking about it on a day-to-day -day basis, but science is a very highly regulated enterprise. Uh, everything that you do sort of touches on policy at some level. Funding for science, so how much money should the federal government allocate to scientific research? How should that money be spent? Should we invest in the physical sciences? Should we invest in the biological sciences? Should we invest in applied research? Should we invest in basic research? How, uh, how the money gets, you know, to, to which scientists that money gets dealt out, the peer review process, those are policy decisions. Uh, training, how many postdocs and graduate students should we train? What should postdoc stipends look like? All of these things are, are what I think of as policy for science issues, and the list sort of goes, um, goes on and on. And there are so many regulations uh, in, in science that one of the, the big areas we deal with is regulatory burden. How do we stop all of these regulations from you know, uh, impeding our ability to actually do scientific research? So where are science policy decisions made? Most of this work happens at the federal level. Um, Congress, the, the legislative branch, the House of Representatives and the Senate, uh, you know, they make the laws of the land. Uh, Congress controls the purse strings, so uh, they're responsible for appropriating money uh, to, the, to, to the scientific disciplines. Uh, they pass, you know, the Animal Welfare Act, um, the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, you know, all, all kinds of laws, you know, Congress is responsible that regulate um, science. Now the executive branch, so that's the White House, that's all of the departments, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Energy, you know, the, the State Department, um, you know, the USDA, you know, they're responsible for uh, implementing laws sort of under the umbrella of, of, of the laws that, that sort of Congress has set out. So lots of science, uh, you know, regulations, guidance, and all that stuff happens in each of the, the scientific agencies and through the White House. The judicial system is not tremendously involved in science policy. Of course, of, of course, the courts aren't making laws, but they are interpreting laws. And so this does sometimes have an impact on policy. So uh, you all probably recall that uh, one of the, the things that President Obama did in his first term was to overturn the Bush era restrictions on stem cell research. And then uh, that got challenged, uh, the legality of his decision got challenged, and that worked its way through the court system. Um, challenges to the teaching of evolution uh, or intelligent design have ended up in the court system. Um, challenges to uh, um, animal rights extremists have, have ended up in the court system. And all of these things, depending on on how the decisions pan out will have an impact uh, on the research community at some level. So the courts are not tremendously, uh, you know, they're not the main player, but there is a role here for the court system. And I said m most of this happens federally, but there also is science policy happening at the state level, that's the New York State Capitol, and also locally. So right here on campus, you know, the administration needs to decide how to interpret the Office of Human Research Protection's guidance on you know, uh, protecting human research subjects, IRBs, the animal, animal codes, lab safety. You know, all of that has to be sort of dealt with at a local level as well. So we do see uh, kind of science policy happening at all these levels and science policy people working at all those levels. 
So it follows, of course, if most of science policy is happening at the government, that a lot of science policy people are going to be employed by the federal government. We have policy people employed uh, in Congress. They might work for individual members who have a strong interest in science and technology policy issues, helping them to sort of draft legislation. They might work for um, the scientific committees. So there's a House Committee on Science. Um, they work for scientific associations, uh, such as mine. You know, the, the American Physical Society has a big policy shop. The American Chemical Society has a big policy shop. Um, you know, we're biomedical uh, science, but the kind of um, AIBS, which is sort of more of the uh, e ecological uh, biology organizations, they have a big policy shop. Um, industry employ, employs government relations uh, people as well. So if you're an energy company, uh, you might want to hire an energy scientist to sort of help you kind of navigate federal regulations, help you sort of lobby for changes that are going to be beneficial to your industry. Um, you know, the same thing uh, in the pharmaceutical uh, industry. There are folks there that kind of help them sort of deal with sort of FDA, help them, you know, lobby for kind of funding and regulatory changes that are beneficial for their enterprises. Universities uh, also hire um, policy people. So most universities, I'm sure Stony Brook has a government relations officer because I saw a job posting for one about a year ago. So, uh, and it may be that they hire, you know, if, if they're concerned about kind of the scientific portfolio, they might be interested in hiring somebody with a PhD uh, and policy knowledge to sort of represent the university's views to the, to the federal or, or state government for that matter, since this is a state organization. Uh, embassies also hire PhDs with an interest in, uh, in, in policy. And then lobbying, lobbying and consulting firms. Uh, again, you know, uh, there are, are, are there are groups that lobby on behalf of universities, and they are sometimes looking for for um, for PhDs as well. So I would say um, my experience is primarily with the scientific associations, since that's you know where you know where I work now, where I come from. Um, but you know, I, I'm happy to to speak to some of the differences and the kinds of things you would do in these other. Uh, areas as well. So this is a good point just to talk to you a little bit about my background. As you probably saw in my my bio, I was here as a psychology major, graduated in 1999. I um, did my senior thesis in uh, biological psychology, um, studying uh, the effects of uh, isolated rearing on serotonin levels in rats and I went to do my PhD on the neurobiology of fear memory learning at the University of Michigan where I graduated in 2005. Uh, from Michigan I did a policy fellowship at the National Academies and then that transitioned into my job at FASEB. So people always want to know more than this like okay but why did you make this decision? What drove you to policy? So I'll, so I'll tell you that. Um, like many uh, people in graduate school or in postdoc, I started out uh, very enthusiastic about becoming an academic researcher. Um, that's why I applied to graduate school and uh, was hoping to start my own neuroscience lab someday. And uh, my interest uh, was uh, increased in uh, grads year one through three. And then I started to think, you know, getting around the time of dissertation writing that you know, maybe, although writing my dissertation was actually one of the, my most favorite things of graduate school, um, I started to realize that maybe bench science wasn't for me. I was thinking, you know, I'm not quite sure this is the direction I want to go. And, and as my uh, grad career progressed, I got that feeling um, more strongly. So what was I thinking? You know, by the time I kind of got to my end of third, fourth year, I was still very passionate about science, um, and I really wanted to contribute to the enterprise. But I wasn't being sort of really, I didn't feel really passionate about the scope of my work or the, the particular work that I was doing. For me, it was a little bit too narrow in focus, and I didn't feel like it was um, engaging me. You know, it wasn't, I say, it wasn't, <laughs> my experiments didn't keep me up at night, at least not in a good way. It wasn't what I was talking with my friends about late at night. These weren't the sort of, I wasn't reading, you know, I mean, I read my journal articles, of course I had to, but it wasn't the first thing I would pick up on a weekend like some of my, my lab mates or colleagues. And I really, so I wanted to contribute uh, to science, but I also wanted a bigger picture view of the enterprise. So um, I had sort of a panic attack. <laughs> like, you know, I'd been training to 
become an academic researcher. And I had approached that almost with, with blinders on. I, I hadn't been thinking about anything else. And here I was going into my fourth year of graduate school and uh, wondering you know, what the heck I was going to do with myself. So uh, I, you know, I started to think, OK, well, again, what is it that I do when I don't you know, run rats through Pavlovian conditioning experiments? You know, what am I talking to people about? What am I, what am I reading? You know? And I realized that I enjoyed the first part of Science Magazine uh, a lot more than I enjoy the primary research articles. I was really interested in reading the policy news and developments and, and those kinds of things. And I started to think, well, you know, maybe maybe policy is something that I could I could get into, but at the time I didn't. I mean, I knew that science policy existed, but I really didn't know what it was or who did it or if if it was even really a viable career path. So um, I I literally Googled science policy and kind of looked at what I found, and a lot of what I found came from the National Academy of Sciences, where that's what they do. They're a policy shop. They advise the government on, on science policy decision making. And I got kind of an idea of the sorts of questions that people address in science policy. And I you know, looked around and explored some other opportunities on the internet, talked to people, called up uh, my old uh, Stony Brook professor, Dr. Marcy Lobel, in the psychology department. And she tapped me into somebody who worked uh, in Washington at the Government Accountability Office. And, um, I just sort of networked and, and kind of got a sense of what was out there. And I applied to some fellowships. And uh, there are fellowships, I'll tell you, we can talk more about this, but think tanks, GAO I mentioned, the National Institutes of Health has fellowships, and the National Academies, uh, and, and a bunch of other organizations. I ended up uh, applying for the Christine, well, or applied for a number, but took the Christine Mirzayan Science and Technology Policy Graduate Fellowship Program. Um, this is a 10-week fellowship program designed to help scientists, graduate students, uh, and early career postdocs transition into science policy careers. And I, I think you have to have completed your PhD or be near completion, but I, I don't, don't hold me to that. And they may have changed it as well. And I worked on a study on the recruitment and retention of women in academic science and engineering. So they were looking at you know, what are the barriers to women's advancement in academia and what policy changes can we make at the federal level and at the, uh, at the university level to, to, help, uh, to help women advance. And it was a really great experience. Like I said, it was 10 weeks. So for folks who are interested in, a, in who, who maybe interested in policy but not quite sure that you want to make that commitment. It's something you can do between graduate school and a postdoc or between two postdocs um, without taking you know, a full year like some of the other fellowships. And it really allowed um, me to make a meaningful contribution to the report. I spent uh, my time doing a lot of um, kind of scientific uh, literature reviews on uh, gender differences or the lack thereof between sort of men and women and cognitive abilities and performance and I applied my my psychology background uh, and my neuroscience background to that was, I think part of what made me appealing for that fit um, had the opportunity to develop and host a policy seminar it's one of the things you do in that uh, in that particular fellowship attended a lot of congressional hearings and briefings uh, which kind of gave me an understanding of what are, again, like what are the different issues folks are you know deal with in science policy? Who who are the players? What are the organizations? And uh, and we had the the cool experience of having the the policy uh, seminar that we organized uh, featured on uh, not C-SPAN but C-SPAN two, uh, which before YouTube was really exciting for us. Um, so that helped me transition into my job at FASEB, having that, that 10 week fellowship experience. So I'm going to switch gears and tell you a little bit about what I do now um, as a, what I did as a science policy analyst when I came to FASEB and, and what I do now as a director of science policy. So my job and the, the job of many policy people who work for scientific societies is to serve as a liaison between the scientific community, all of you who are members of our member societies, and the federal government. So we represent the views of scientists to the government 
Um, and we do that by sort of tracking and analyzing legislative, regulatory, and policy issues. So for example, um, you know, earlier this year, or even last year, the National Institutes of Health issued a request for information to the scientific community about what they should do about the scientific workforce. How do we you know, ensure that we're creating a sustainable workforce, that we're creating attractive careers for young scientists? And so they were looking for feedback from the scientific community uh, on this. And so um, at FASEB, we we, we look for these sorts of opportunities, take them to the scientists who are our members, gather information, collect data, analyze policy data, and sort of package that, you know, recommendations to then give to sort of NIH on this and, 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 and other issues. So, so, um, so, we, so we will also organize policy symposia to inform policy decisions and then we do a lot of writing of you know of, of letters and statements and advocacy materials that we we send off to the government in the interest of uh, influencing their their decision making so just to give you a sort of a some more concrete examples of the sorts of things we did uh, when I first started I worked on an evolution education project so this is right around the time that um, how many people have heard of the, that Dover intelligent design De, uh, decision kind of seven or eight years ago back in Pennsylvania uh, and this has happened since you know groups are trying to get schools to incorporate the teaching of intelligent design as an alternative to evolution um, and as a biological research organization this is something we just had to get involved in um, so we did a, a, a lot of different things around that issue but you know we conducted public opinion research to examine how to bolster support for teaching evolution so how is it that we can convey to people that evolution is not just a theory you know what is it that you know that we need to what what, what are the messages that are going to resonate with with folks and then we created advocacy materials based on those research findings we can created a lot of materials for our scientists so that they can go out and talk to their communities about why it's so important to have evolution in public schools. Um, and then we also did letter writing campaigns when um, you know, state legislatures tried to, you know, in Texas, they tried to um, you know, insert uh, intelligent design into the curriculum and, and we had you know, our scientists in Texas you know, write letters to the Texas legislature to tell them why this was such a, a terrible idea. Uh, in training, uh, we've done a lot of work uh, in support of the, the postdoctoral research community. Um, we've urged NIH to increase stipends and benefits for postdocs. Um, we've uh, encouraged improvements in career and professional development training, and we've developed career and professional development resources for postdocs. And I'll tell you more about that later. Clinical research is also another uh, area I work in. If any of you do human subjects research, you know how uh, onerous it can be to get a protocol through an institutional review board. Um, and it, it's not that institutional review boards shouldn't exist, of course they should, but there are a lot of challenges in terms of whether the regulations from NIH are harmonized with the regulations from FDA. Do you understand the regulations? The consent forms need to be really big, and so there, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to improve these regulations so that we can both protect human uh, human subjects, so human research participants, but also make sure that scientists can can get their research done in the most uh, efficient way possible. So the the federal government recognizes that the uh, institutional review board process is. Uh, is problematic and so this is another case where they issued a request for information to the scientific community how can we streamline this what are the things that we can do to sort of improve this process and so we you know spent several months kind of working with our scientists to send recommendations back to the government you know, here are the changes that we think sort of would be most helpful um, and then we also recently um, did a project on translational research. You know, translational science is the the buzzword in in, in biology these days. Uh, we're uh, very much uh, we have basic and clinical and translational researchers in our organization, but we're primarily a basic science 
organization. And so we were looking at, well, how can we get basic scientists sort of, how can they take advantage of this uh, move towards translational research and how, how can we facilitate their involvement? What policy changes do we need to make at the government level? What can universities do through changes in tenure and promotion and so on and so forth? So that's just kind of a, a whirlwind tour just to give you some sort of specifics of the kinds of policy issues we deal with at the, um, at the association level. And if you're thinking about whether science policy is right for you, these are some of the questions I suggest you, you ask yourself. One is, do you enjoy learning a little bit uh, about a lot of things instead of a lot about a little, right? So as scientists, we are deep. You know, we learn a whole lot about a very narrow field. And if you go into policy, chances are, you know, you're not going to be able to specialize uh, in the way that you, you do currently in your labs. You're going to be, you know, I work on training, I work on clinical research, I work on peer review, I work on evolution education. I have a particularly broad portfolio of things, and so it's not necessarily going to be the case, but I can guarantee you that you'll uh, have to be okay with, you know, having kind of a, a, a broader kind of range of, of science knowledge. Do you keep up with the science policy news and events? Is this something that, that interests you? Are you following these things? You know, if you're not, then you're probably not that interested in science policy. You know, if you are, well, that's a good sign. Um, do you like interacting with people and building consensus? If you're squirreled away in the uh, lab all day, avoiding your colleagues and uh, not really wanting to talk, talk to people, then science policy might not, not be the thing for you. Those of you who uh, have formed or joined committees and are interested in sort of consensus building and uh, kind of persuading people that you've got sort of great ideas for initiatives, well, that's something we do a lot of in science policy. So if you like that process, then that's something to consider. Um, and this sort of relates committee management. Almost everything that happens in a scientific association, um, and as well as at the government level, um, happens through a committee. Um, so there's a lot, there's just a lot of, of working with others to build consensus around an issue. It's rare that, you know, you, you, know, you, you can execute your experiment, you know, on your own or with the folks in your lab and, and publish a paper. You can't really do that in science policy. Everything involves kind of consensus building and managing others. Writing uh, is a, a huge thing. Um, I just write nonstop, whether it's meeting summaries or press releases or letters to the editor on policy topics or letters to NIH on, on what they can do to support postdocs. We are writing all the time. Um, and you need to be able to write for lay audiences and policymakers because policy makers don't understand your experiment. They, they will not you know, necessarily understand the topic of your dissertation unless you can find a way to, to sort of put that in, in sort of more lay terms. If you like doing that, then policy is definitely something that you should consider. Some of the challenges for scientists and certainly uh, for me, again, com communicating science to the public and policymakers, it's just a very different thing. You, you, the way you communicate is, in policy is very different from the way you write your, your research articles or put your poster together. Another thing that's challenging is policy is not driven by facts alone. Um, you know, we bring as many facts into it as we can, but sometimes there isn't data on an issue that the federal government is looking for input on. Uh, and even if there, you know, even if the data do exist, you need to, you know, policies get forged through consensus and compromise. And so even if, you know, X is the correct action to take to mitigate climate change, if you can't get that through, uh, you know, um, the, the, the House Science Committee, it doesn't matter if, if it's the right idea. You have to find a way to find an idea that's going to be sort of palatable, you know, to others. So consensus building um, is, again, is, <laughs> if, if you don't want to sort of compromise on the facts, then that's something, you know, policy might be sort of hard for you. Uh, and then it can be really slow. Um, 
you know, one of the things that frustrated me about science was the slow pace. And I thought, well, I'll go into policy and I'll be able to have this great impact. It's just slow. <laughs> it's just, it's just different. You know, it, it, it has the same, inc you know, incrementalism uh, as, as science does sort of making policy decisions. So you've all got that covered if you're a scientist. Um, you have a limited opportunity for authorship. So, you know, authorship is really the coin of the realm in, in academia. Uh, in policy, you may not get your name on papers. I write a lot of things on which my name never appears. Uh, you know, almost all of the letters that I write that get sent to NIH or to Congress are signed by our president, not, not by me. Uh, you know, I write articles for our president, you know, press releases for our president. So. Um, it's, it can be challenging and a little disconcerting when you come out of graduate school not to have your name on, on your products. And it can also be challenging, therefore, to establish your expertise in a particular area if you're the person that's behind the scenes. Um, that doesn't particularly bother me, but it bothers some people. And if that's the case, then policy may not, may not be the thing that you want to do. Um, but if you think you're, you're, you want to make the, the, the leap, um, here are some of the, the skills that you're going to need. And the good news is you have a lot of the, the skills that are, are necessary. So you all have a broad knowledge of science, uh, hopefully, and a, and, a, and a detailed knowledge of your specific discipline, and an understanding of the scientific process and scientific methodology, and both of those things are particularly important if you are on the science for policy and of policy decision making, right? Like if you are helping the government devise, you know, um, global warming mitigation strategies, if you don't know your science, you're probably not going to be very helpful. Um, also, insider knowledge of science policy issues. So you know what it's like to work in a laboratory. You understand the impact of human subjects, protections regulations, or animal regulations on your work. You know, you, uh, you, you have that firsthand knowledge of how policy hampers or uh, expedites the scientific process. And that is really important because in all of the work that we, we do in representing our scientists, we need to ask them, how is this policy going to, to impact you? Like we, you know, so, so having an understanding of how that works in the laboratory is really important. Um, analytical and critical thinking skills, you know, you all have that. That's really important. Uh, capable of learning complex uh, material really quickly. Um, I, uh, that's something, you know, I, I can't sort of underestimate. We, Every issue that I have worked on at, at FASEB is something I knew nothing about when I, I, I started working on it. But, you know, I got a PhD and, you know, learned a whole field and you all have you know, done, you know, done postdocs and sort of learned new techniques and, and you are, are very good at being able to approach a whole new area and, and learn it quickly and, and get it done. And then project management is a skill that you, you all uh, have or, or should be developing. You know, you're, you're managing, you know, multiple projects in the lab. You're probably teaching your classes, you're mentoring undergraduates. And so, you know, this is a really great experience for, for any job and, uh, and also for, for policy. Skills you, you may need to develop, communication. Do you see a theme here? <laughs> communication is the probably single most important skill. When we interview um, new PhDs uh, or postdocs for entry level science policy jobs, it's, the, it's one of the first things we ask them. What kind of experience do you have communicating non-technically or communicating to lay audiences? You know, I want you to be able to tell me what your dissertation is, you know, in a 30 seconds to a minute so that my boss, who's a sociologist, can understand it, you know, even if you're a physicist. Um, consensus building. If you have had work on committees, if you've had uh, uh, opportunities to shepherd an initiative through, that's really important. If you don't, something you probably want to work on. Again, committee management. And a basic understanding of the policy process. It's not necessary for you to be a policy expert. You don't need to even have taken necessarily a policy course. 
but you're going to want to demonstrate that you kind of know who the players are and, and where policy gets made and what some of the big issues are is certainly helpful. So how can you um, acquire these skills? You're all very busy finishing your dissertations or starting a new postdoc and it's certainly not easy to go out and get a you know, another master's degree in policy or a certificate. But there's a lot you can do. One, again, read the science policy news. Read the front part of science and nature as much as you can, you know, during your lunch. If you have the time, volunteer to write for the newsletter, if there's a, a campus newsletter or your alumni magazine, science blogs, you know, look for opportunities to, you know, the, the, the National Postdoc Association has a postdoc it magazine. I know they're often looking for, for submissions for that. If you can identify opportunities to get some writing skills, that will be really helpful. Serve, uh, serve on a committee. Some of you are doing that through the Postdoc Association. That is really excellent experience. Um, if you can give talks to, uh, you know, to high school students or at the local library, if they're kind of doing a, a science seminar or you start a science seminar, even better, that's an opportunity to give sort of talks to the lay public. If your societies do a Capitol Hill Day, uh, that's something you, know, you might consider volunteering for. You know, come down to Washington and get some experience talking to your representatives. Um, we love to see that. And, uh, and even, even responding to the e-action alerts and such that the societies send out is a way to sort of demonstrate your interest and engagement in the issue. Uh, taking a policy course, again, you all probably don't have time for a whole lot of courses, but you know, if you, if you can, can fit in you know, something on, uh, on the legislative process or you know, non-technical writing or, or something along, you know, bioethics even is, is something that you might consider. And then seeking out fellowship and internship opportunities. So um, I don't know if these slides, are these slides going to be made available? OK. So, so then you can, uh, you can get the URL. But if you Google Discover Magazine Policy Fellowships, you'll come up with a big list of science policy fellowships. And, again, and they're through all different kinds of organizations. Uh, one of the most popular ones is the AAAS, Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. Uh, this is a one-year fellowship. Um, it's fellowships.aaas.org, um, and it one year, and I think it's there's the option for a second year uh, renewal. Um, what does it say? They have 279 fellows that they choose, and they spend a year in one of 15 executive branch agencies and several congressional offices, um, and. There are 34 scientific and engineering societies that support this fellowship, which means that it's broadly interdisciplinary. There are physicists, chemists, engineers, people from every discipline come through this fellowship program. And um, it really, uh, I served as a reviewer for the fellowship program last year, and um, it really is a great experience. The, the people who, who do it really go on to do really amazing things and, and get really great placements. Um, if you're not, well, let me, let me just go back to this for a second. As I was telling Lydia, if you're interested in a science policy career, and as particularly if you've gotten some experience doing non-technical writing and working on a committee, and you don't land a fellowship, don't think that that means that you can't break into science policy. We've had people come in our office straight from graduate school, straight from a postdoc, no formal internship or fellowship. It's definitely possible. So if you, if you see an opportunity, uh, don't, don't be afraid to apply for it. If you're not interested in a policy career, I'm going to encourage you all to get involved anyway. Um, as I think I've demonstrated through all the various topics, science impacts policy, and policy has a huge impact on science. We are facing a major fiscal crisis in this country, and uh, we really risk science being on the chopping block uh, when, when um, you know, if, if sequestration hits. Uh, and, and we need as many scientists as possible to, to speak out and, and talk to their representatives about the, the importance of, of science. And I brought some of the fact sheets that we use when we go, um, when we go to Congress to talk about the importance of science funding. And, and I apologize to those of you not in the biological sciences because they're very biology focused. But you know, we try to convey to Congress the importance of funding, you know, the, the, the impact that funding for science 
influence at the national level has on the local community. You know, this is how much this is how much money comes to Stony Brook University. This is how many sort of biotech companies you know get get supported. This is how many students we employ. You know, these are the cures that have come out of funding for uh, for science. These are the new technologies that have come out of uh, physics and engineering research and so on and so forth. So um, it's really important for scientists to make that case because you all have credibility and you have expertise on these issues. And even though um, all of your disciplines, most of them anyway, employ people like me uh, to make that case for you, it's not the same. You know, if I go up and speak to, uh, you know, now that I live in Washington, D.C., if I go up and speak to the representative, uh, you know, senators from New York or representatives from the Stony Brook Upton area, it doesn't have the same resonance for that member of Congress uh, as it does coming from you, their constituent. They want to hear from their constituents, not from the people who are paid <laughs> to, to lobby for science. Um, so, if you want to know more, you can visit our website, uh, opa.fasab.org. We have a, a ton of, of materials uh, on there to help you uh, advocate um, and, and learn how to get involved in, in advocacy, um, talking points, and all those sorts of things. And uh, I'd be happy to, to tell you more about that. So I want to tell you also about a, a career and professional development um, tool we have. But before I do that, let me stop and take questions on the on the policy side of things. Any questions? Um, so you spoke about that in the last year of your PhD you got it, you took the fellowship, mm -hmm. the design fellowship. My question is, how do you get your advisor to let you out of the lab and go do a fellowship? This might be specific to me or for probably not. But yeah. Well, so the fellowship for me I had a, it, it was ideal because I defended my dissertation at the end of April, and so I was at a stopping point. Um, it really will depend on your own experience with your advisor. I don't know many PIs who are going to let their graduate student or postdoc, you know, leave for two and a half months and not do any work in the lab. So it certainly helps to be at a transition point, you know, between graduate school or postdoc or between two postdocs. If you're not at that stage, then you maybe need to sort of scale back your expectations and think about, okay, well, I can't do a fellowship, but what's your discipline? Biomedical engineering. Biomedical engineering. So you could potentially, Biomedical Engineering Society is one of our societies, see if you could serve on their policy or advocacy committee if they have one. That way you're not out of the lab for two months, you're maybe on, you know, a two-hour phone call once a month and helping them, you know, write write some policy statements and those kinds of things. You know, again, it, it just, it, de it, it depends. But I, I do recommend, like, talking, you know, to the extent that you, you have a, a good relationship with your advisor, talking to them early about your career interests. And, and uh, if, if you really think policy is the way to go, having that conversation and seeing if you can come to a mutually agreeable arrangement about how you can continue to get the work done in the lab uh, while also gaining the kinds of experiences you're, you're going to need to advance your career. Other questions? Okay, well then let me tell you about um, this tool that we've developed. So um, how many, have folks heard of my IDP or my individual development plan? A couple. So. This is a tool developed in collaboration with FASAB, uh, uh, Phil Clifford, who's a physiologist at Medical College of Wisconsin, uh, and Bill Lindstad and Cynthia Furman, who are uh, both scientists and uh, career uh, counselors uh, at the University of California, San Francisco. And we all have sort of recognized the need to help graduate students and postdocs explore uh, the various careers that uh, that are out there beyond uh, academia and industry, and I think most of us have been at, at the point in our career where I suspect many of you are, uh, which is you know, I'm here I am, you know, I I'm doing a PhD or I'm doing a postdoc and I'm preparing to to go into academia, but maybe that's not right for me. But I don't know what's out there, so. Um, 
my IDP is a tool designed to sort of help uh, PhD level scientists uh, in in all disciplines, ass, you know, assess their um, career skills, interests, and values, and sort of use that information to sort of match them to uh, common career paths for for scientists. So um, it's at myidp.sciencecareers.org. Um, it takes you through a, a step of self-assessment self materials. So as I said, there are, there's a skills assessment um, which asks you to rate yourself. It's a subjective assessment in all of these various sort of scientific areas, scientific knowledge, research skills, communication, you know, professionalism, management and leadership skills, uh, responsible conduct of research and career planning. Um, there's an interest assessment that uh, tries to get at, you know, what is it they actually like doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Do you like designing the experiments? Do you like executing them? Or are you really more interested in the big picture, you know, writing the grant proposals, coming up with the big ideas? You know, do you like teaching? Do you hate teaching? You know, those sorts of things. Um, and then a values assessment, which is intended to sort of get at Again, again, these sort of bigger picture things that you want to get out of your career. Like, what is important to you? Is it important for you to make a lot of money? Is it important for you to be the expert? You know, do you need to be the leader or manager, or are you okay to, you know, to sort of work in a group where the responsibility uh, for, for pulling off the project is shared? You know, things like. Um, variety, like do you need to be doing something different every day or are you okay to be sort of working on the same kind of thing over and over. Um, and so after you fill out these assessments, the uh, My IDP gives you a match, a skills match and an interest match for uh, the 20 careers that are, are represented in the module. And so this is, you know, the, the, the common careers are represented, you know, research in academia, research in industry, um, you know, a, 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 a faculty position, a teaching position, policy writing, uh, um, science education, uh, clinical practice, um, what else do we have? Business of science, those of you who are sort of interested in the sort of entrepreneurial uh, angle. Um, research administration, so if you're thinking of a job, um, you know, as a, a scientific review officer at one of, one of the funding agencies, this kind of gives you a gauge of, um, of how well you might fit that career path based on your current skills and interests. The idea is not to be prescriptive here, you know, it's not to say if you get a 56% on science writing that you absolutely shouldn't be a science writer. This was um, the matching algorithm was developed in coordination with, I think it was 15 or so experienced career counselors who work with PhD scientists. And this was their sort, if you had come into their office and said, here's what I'm really good at, here are the things I need to work at, here's where my interests are, this is what I'm looking for in a career, this is the kind of advice you might get from them. So this is sort of the level at which kind of we, we design this. It's not here is the career for you. This is the kind of advice you might get if you had a sit down with an experienced career counselor. And then, um, and then you can click uh, on each of the, the, the skills scores and get a, 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 a more in-depth assessment of, of wh where you were matched and where you weren't matched. Right, so in Read About Careers, we have a list of resources for all of the career paths represented in the module. So uh, articles on science policy careers, articles on science writing, articles on research administration. Um, so you can then take this information and do your own exploration and come to a better understanding you know, again, our matching is just kind of a guideline. This is where you might want to start your search. And then you hopefully will go and, and read and talk to people and do some more in-depth exploration and decide, okay, this is, this is the, the career path I want to pursue. So we have, um, there's a, a goal setting component which allows you to, to set uh, goals for um, uh, acquiring new skills, um, 
uh, uh, finishing your projects in the lab and then career advancement goals. So um, that might be, you know, I'm going to work on my CV or I'm going to learn how to, I'm going to brush up on my interviewing skills. Uh, for the, the, the skills goals, the way that it works is you can select the areas that you want to improve and um, let's see. And then you'll you'll you can set goals around those those areas. And at the end, um, your summary will give you a a printout of basically everything you've put uh, in into my IDP. It, uh, you can print out a report, and it will show you what you've identified your your long term goals to be. It gives in chronological order. These are the goals you're going to work on, you know, throughout the year. And then you can also get um, uh, automatic reminders so that, you know, that that will come once a month. You said that you were going to write the introduction to this article. Have you done that? Um, and we programmed it such that you will only, you have to opt into the reminder and you only get it once per month. Uh, so, um, but the idea being that, uh, you know, research shows that if you actually write down goals, you're more likely to fulfill them uh, and having a reminder helps you to stay accountable to them. So we launched this on uh, September 8th, 6th, 6th, 7th, or 8th, and we've got about uh, 18,000 users in the system already, uh, which is really great. Um, we're hoping uh, down the road to collect some, some data to see uh, how useful it's been, but you know, so far, uh, folks have, have have found it helpful. You know, the, the the informal feedback is that you know, at a minimum, it's kind of given people sort of an idea of the kinds of careers that are out there, and sort of helped them think about about the the, the, the skills they might want to develop. So let me stop there, and I'm t I can take any questions on this or policy. Lydia. Do you have any idea whether those eighteen thousand is US or like you, you access people everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. No. So I was I was uh, saying this to Lynn earlier. Unfortunately, we did not include any demographic questions uh, on it because we're collecting some sensitive information. We're asking people to self-report on their skills, tell us about their career values. Um, there's a lot of sensitivity around this issue. People don't want their advisors necessarily to have access to this information. And of course, it's all the information is protected, uh, and you know. It's not shared. But, yeah, uh, I'm, not, I'm not even talking about the specific institution, just the country. Yeah, right? yeah, no, we, we, we need that information, but we don't have it. So what we might do is go back and, uh, and add some questions and then have people, they can, people can volunteer to answer them. Or we might do a retrospective survey to see who the users are. Because I think, you know, that information would be tremendously useful. Like, we don't even know are the folks mostly grad students or mostly postdocs or what. Because I, meeting from Europe, I know that the, the, the workforce uh, and searching for work and the idea of, you know, having an alternative, alternative or different career than academic in Europe may be a little different than in the US. Mm -hmm. So I was just curious how that particular tool is being received in Europe. Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. We actually got an email from um, someone from Lithuania who wanted to develop a tailored tool for Lithuanian scientists, uh, and and we had some interest from uh, a Puerto Rican science organization uh, to sort of translate it into Spanish. And of course, you know, we need to pay attention to this is designed very much for American, you know scientists in mind, mostly because that's sort of our background. Um, and there is a question of, are, real, are these the careers that are available in Lithuania and Puerto Rico and Germany or wherever? Right. But, you know, it would, it would, it would, it would certainly be good to explore that further. And, uh, and I think if we can, if we can get, some, uh, get some funds to develop the tool further, we're definitely going to do that. If you do use it, I would strongly encourage you to send us feedback. Um, we are 
trying to make this as useful to as many disciplines as possible, trying to tailor it uh, as best we can to the needs of the scientific community. And, um, and even though we can't respond to all of the inquiries we get, we're keeping very good notes of them. And, and we hope that this will just be, you know, my IDP, you know, version 1.0, and we'll have the opportunity to make it even more useful going forward. So, any other questions? I would encourage everybody in the room to use this, the IDP. You can do this without the knowledge or interest of your PI or your fellow graduates and postdocs. So there's a high degree of privacy here, and this is totally yours. Uh, because I know sometimes people hesitate to do basic career exploration because they're concerned about what department you think. This is between you and your IP address. So by all means, do it. And we won't look up your IP address even. I do have uh, mostly a curiosity from your uh, first part of the talk, in terms mostly of your background, and it's in terms of the job search. How, how did you do it if you're interested in, in the policy that you went? It's just depending on uh, if you're going to be working for the government or, uh, or a particular um, society. How, how was in your case? That's a great question. So, so one of the the things that so in policy most of our jobs are posted in because many of them are Washington DC based we post them in the Washington Post uh, in DC there is a science policy jobs listserv and um, if you email me I should have given you my email address it's J H O B I N so that's J Hoban at faseb f a s e b dot org and if you're interested in a science policy career, um, there's an informal but very helpful science policy jobs listserv that I'm on. And it has lists, it goes out two weeks, once a month, every two weeks, once a month. Um, and it just has a list of jobs across all scientific disciplines, in government, in the private sector, uh, industry, not-for-profits. That's really helpful. Um, if you're looking for a government job, US, USA Jobs, um, dot gov is a great place to look. Um, look on the jobs boards of your scientific society. Those are mostly going to be scientific jobs, but you do sometimes see policy jobs. Um, you know, if you know, you, if you have a disciplinary society, look to see whether they're hiring themselves. You know, they might be hiring, you know, policy analyst or communications people. Um, so for me, I just you know, I, I got on the jobs listserv, I looked at usajobs.gov, and I went to the websites of organizations that I knew that did policy and just looked at their employment uh, opportunities. And one last question. So you said that it's uh, difficult to set uh, your expertise in, a, in, you know, to, to not demonstrate it, but, you know, how, how you do it when you do a lot of, like, writing without necessarily the acknowledge of your name. How did you progress in, the, in, in this type of career? How do you make sure that you are? Yeah, so I, it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend uh, organization by organization. I mean, part of it is, is building your um, network within your community. So, you know, even though I, uh, I haven't had a lot of opportunities to author papers, although I have, and I'll tell you about that, I have done some. You know, when you're in science policy, you kind of make yourself visible by going to meetings, you know, speaking up at these meetings, networking with others. You know, if you are, if, if, I, if, if our president is delivering, you know, testimony to Congress on the federal science budget, you know, our legislative, our legislative director is there with her, and the other legislative directors of the other folks who are testifying are there. And so people, people start to appreciate your contributions to the process. You know, it is important to look for, for other opportunities. So one of the things I've been able to do is take advantage of writing pieces for our member society magazines. So I write about four articles a year for ASBMB Today, which is the, the, the 
magazine that they send to their membership on science policy topics. It's not a journal article, but it's a way for me to get my name on something on training and workforce and show that you know I, I'm in, you know I have some expertise in, in this in this area. Um, I have taken you know some opportunities to do some. Um, publishing in the in the scientific literature on the evolution work that we did we uh, sent a, a an, an opinion piece to developmental dynamics on the importance of getting scientists engaged in in teaching evolution uh, I'm working on a paper on the IDP process for academic medicine right now so it's not that's not kind of what we normally do but you will there will be times when when you'll have opportunity to to author an op-ed or uh, or, or, or something like that. You know, I have colleagues who, a colleague recently who published an article in Science Magazine on dual use research. So it, it, it's, it's not the same as, it's not your job to publish in the same way it is in academia, but you look for opportunities, and, and, there, and there, there definitely are some. Um, sorry, hold on. Um, you said you started out as a policy analyst, and now you're a, a director of uh, policy issues or whatever. Mm -hmm. So what, how did you ad advance or what, how did you make that transition or, or what skills did you, I guess, gather in order to, you know, progress from one stage to the next? Right. So, so I've, so I've made this progression in the, within the same organization. Um, policy analyst is the position at which we generally hire new PhD, you know, entering PhDs or people right from postdoc. If you work on the legislative affairs side, and that's something I should have mentioned, in the scientific society world, um, offices tend to be broken at, down into legislative affairs. These are, tend to be our lobbyists, the people who are doing the meetings on the Hill, you know, writing testimony, um, uh, kind of meeting with the appropriators, the policy people. Uh, who sort of develop the policy position statements and do the policy analysis and then com and then communications. Um, so if you were interested in the legislative side, you might start out as a legislative affairs officer, just mm -hmm. for example, if you're looking for titles. Um, so for me, I think I was able to advance uh, partly by, you know, taking on uh, new issues. You know, I expressed an interest in, you know, I, I came on to to, to work primarily on training and workforce and a little bit of clinical research, but you know I showed an interest in in learning all of the different policy issues that our our op organization de deals with. Um, I looked for for opportunities to do sort of some of the communications aspects of what we do. So I, I did a lot of like writing of press releases and uh, and and those and those sorts of things. Um, you know, I had the opportunity to mentor our new policy analysts, and then that sort of turned into an opportunity to become sort of their their supervisor. So, I mean, it's not really any different from the way it happens in any other job. You know, you start out sort of not knowing much, and you you learn more as you go, and the more you learn and the more confident you become, you, you, you take on additional responsibilities. And so... Um, so I was able to to uh, work my way my way up that way, um, and I should say that uh, I actually, as of January second, I'll no longer be working at FASA. I took a position as a director of science policy at the American Association for Cancer Research. Uh, so now I'm I'm looking at uh, learning a whole new uh, set of of policy issues uh, there. So. so I've noticed that you stated that you could either go into policy. Uh, graduate school or after you get your postdoc or in between. But I'm not sure if you, if I guess, what happens if you're like an established faculty member and you want to transition to science policy? Like what stages, in, I guess, in the in your career do you normally see people engage in science policy then? Because ideally they both go hand in hand. Yeah, so, uh, and I didn't mean to imply that, that you should only, or could only go after graduate school or postdoc, just that most of the, at least for the Christine Mirzayan policy fellowship that I did through the National Academies, they take people just out of graduate school or early career postdoc. Now the AAAS Science Policy Fellowship will take scientists from any stage of their career and we've had full professors apply. Um, and not even because they wanted 
to now establish a career in science policy, although some of them did, but because they appreciated the importance of science policy or science communications for the work that they did on their campus, uh, or they wanted, you know, they just wanted to sort of be uh, more well-rounded and thought it would benefit them and benefit their community. So you really can enter at any stage. Um, it's generally important to have gotten your PhD. Um, that's not to say that you, you can't get a, a science policy job at a master's level, you can, but for the most part, the organizations are looking and the government are looking at PhD level candidates. You know, if for no other reason, then you're com there are a lot of PhDs to compete with, right? So take a PhD if we can. Um, but I think at, at, any, at any stage is, is good. And uh, if you're, you know, what I would suggest is if you're not sure that you want to leave science, then it probably makes sense to like do the postdoc, you know, if you're in graduate school, do a postdoc. Because once you kind of have gone out of science for a couple years, it's harder to get back in and go back on the academic tenure track and such. But I really think you can come to policy at any stage in your career. Any other questions? So I just want to say a big thank you to Jennifer Wilson.